There aren't many products that you can use without opening the package. To demonstrate the existence of small zones of repulsion or confinement near permanent magnets, I didn't need to open this package. It amused me not to, but it also serves to illustrate one of my key goals in making this video, to show how you can use magnets readily bought from home, hardware, automotive, or craft stores for a few dollars and do some fun magnetic force experimentation. My plastic tube is just a rolled up piece of disposable water bottle. The steel shards are mostly cut from empty food cans, but one is a finishing nail that I cut to be a bit shorter than the zone of interest. My method is to push the shard into the plastic tube within the confinement zone and then orient the tube vertically and see how far I can move the object off center before it loses the repulsion and drops down. I do use an unpackaged magnet horizontally to show that this is not justifying gravity. The shards will push or pull towards a specific distance from the magnet along its axis. In the still images I show some other unpackaged magnets. On the left I placed two block magnets far enough apart that I could let go without having them fly together and I found I could still hover a small ball magnet between them. On the right, I use a tuna can to hold three disc magnets in place near each other and demonstrate hovering a fourth magnet in the center. Hello, I'm Doug Cragen, team leader for testing and benchmarking at Integrate and Engineering Software, and in front of me I have some of my favorite magnetic toys. I've been playing with them a lot more lately because of some of the work that I've been doing reigniting my imagination about permanent magnets and the forces that they exhibit, like the two that you see stuck to the front and back of my hand here. And if you've played with magnets like I have a lot, you know this kind of thing very well. You, you kind of take a magnet, you can move them around, um, you can use one to control the other and see all the flipping, rotating and so on. In general, we talk about there being three degrees of motion freedom and three degrees of rotational freedom in empty space. And uh, there's very little constraint here. There's gravity pulling down and there's my hand getting in the way of them just pulling together. But when they're free to rotate around three different taxis and free to move in three different directions, you can generate a lot of fun effects by kind of taking them and twisting them around relative to each other. So just playing with a couple of block magnets is one of the things that I do for fun and education. Some of my other toys are actually made as toys, like this one which you may recognize as Silly Putty, but why is it gray? Well, it's gray because it probably has iron in it, but it's magnetic, so I can take a magnet and, you know, kind of enhance my play with its Silly Putty by dangling it from magnets and so on. So that's a great source of fun for me. At home, uh, I have a magnet on a rod that I use for purposes like picking up a bolt that falls behind a bench and is impossible to reach. So if I just take a small magnet and have a bunch of it, scraps of steel around like bolts and whatever, you can just bring a magnet near them and pick them all up. So that's both fun to do and, uh, and useful. <clears throat> This one's a favorite of mine. I've played endlessly with 216 little ball magnets. So right now I've arranged them nicely in a cube, which is not easy to do, but I've found a process that lets me get there. But I can take them and just kind of stretch them out. They tend to pull into these interacting lines. You can take them and form a whole variety of shapes that you could never get just as steel spheres to uh, stick with. <clears throat> Down here, we have what I've heard called a Gaussian cannon, just as steel balls with a magnet in the middle, 
and uh, the amount of impulse generated generally surprises people the first time they see it. Um, it appears that you're getting energy from nowhere. Now, this is getting closer to what I actually became interested in more recently. One of my longtime toys is just a pen holder, but it's a magnetic pen holder. And along the pen, there's a permanent magnet about there and about there. There's permanent magnets here, 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 and here. Um, and if we don't arrange it right, you can see it doesn't hover. But if we arrange it perfectly, it hovers. But I'm sure if they could have, they would have made it so that it hovered just in empty space. But you see a little piece of plexiglass here. And I've actually done modeling of this with our software Amperes and verified that if you try to construct it, let's say, so two pens have a cancelling force. Yes, there is a cancelling force, but something called Earnshaw's theorem dictates all kinds of things that I'm going to be showing today in this video. Earnshaw's theorem basically says you can't have completely stable confinement. But you can, as in a case like this, have it where very minimal confinement at one spot is all that you need in order to keep it from, um, from flying altogether in order to achieve, in this case, the hovering. This didn't surprise me that it's possible because this is a magnet and you know that if you constrain magnets right, you can get them to repel each other. But what I've never experienced previously, in part because I never tried the right configurations or, or uh, maybe, maybe uh, held them in the right way and thought about what I was feeling the right way, I've never experienced that a piece of steel can repel away from a magnet. And yet, in some modeling that I was doing, I found exactly that. I found a, a prediction that steel blocks would repel away from magnet blocks. And I presented uh, Ampere's model of this to Dexter Magnetics and asked them, is this real or is this a problem that I need to track down in the software? And they were kind enough to actually build it and send it to me. And lo and behold, yes, a piece of steel can levitate above a magnet. So I presented that last month and I wanted to just finish up with something that's a little bit more fun because what I learned there let me do what I showed in the introductory video. It let me figure out how to just go out and buy anything, just two disc magnets and hover something between them. So I'm going to focus the rest of this video on explaining how this happens, why it happens, so that you can make your own kinds of predictions. I hope it's fun and educational for you, but I do want to finish up with one point. I hope particularly to inspire kids. This kind of thing might be good for science fair projects and so on, but uh, keep safety in mind. Before you give magnets to young children especially, make sure that you're educated about safety issues. With lots of this, there's the potential for pinched fingers, obviously, cutting oneself on shards of steel, but most importantly, swallowing a magnet is no small issue. It's not like small swallowing a penny or something like that. You do not ever want to give a small enough magnet to a young enough child that they might put it in their mouth and swallow it. So keep safety in mind, but I hope otherwise this is fun. Thank you. It would be natural to expect that more rings and or stronger magnets would result in a stronger force, thus a higher levitation. In the video, I'm using a ball magnet rather than steel because I couldn't support a ball of steel with only one ring. So, this is a little bit true, but mostly it is best to think of this as a confinement zone controlled by the geometry of the magnets. 
The stronger the field, the higher the forces, thus the stronger the confinement, but the location is not much affected. In fact, the confinement zone for a ring below the top one is a bit lower, thus the zone moves downwards when you use two rings. I've summarized this on the right with some comparisons of the ball hovering position for one, two, three, and four magnets. It gets progressively lower and lower. In the graph, I show an Ampere's parametric analysis of the force on the ball. Everywhere the force is above the thick black horizontal line, the ball is repelled upwards. Everywhere below this line, the ball is attracted downwards. The vertical colored lines show the locked in positions for each set of magnets. Anywhere slightly above or below this line pulls or pushes the ball back to this position. This has been a useful benchmark for me because even though the magnets I bought come without specifying remnants or coercivity and the steels from food cans are unknown permeability, those details don't affect the equilibrium position, so I don't need to know them. Thus, Amperes is able to predict the equilibrium positions very well. To understand these forces, one needs to think in terms of field gradients, not just fields. For illustration, in the video I'm showing some experimentation with the confinement of a sphere magnet between two short rod magnets, initially aligned anti-parallel, then aligned parallel. I have graph paper underneath to help me try to keep the magnet symmetric on either side. I chose this example for understanding, not for easy demonstration. What I'm calling repulsion or confinement zones are unstable equilibrium. That is, a precise balance point is possible where the magnetic repulsion supports the weight of a hovering object. but. Practically speaking, tiny disturbances occur, and without a bit of stabilizing constraint, everything would just pull together in very little time. If the ring is considered as a challenge similar to balancing a baseball on top of a basketball, on that scale, this is as challenging as standing a pen on end and balancing an egg on top of that. But, with loose constraint of the tube, and multiple attempts to bring magnets in from the side symmetrically, I can achieve the states I want for short periods of time in the video. Locally, an unconstrained magnet will align itself with an impressed field, while a ferromagnet material such as steel or iron will magnetize aligned with the impressed field. Thus, either way, you have a local magnetization aligned with the impressed field. The difference is mainly that the magnet has a strong magnetization even in a weak compressed field, while a ferromagnet only has a strong magnetization in a strong impressed field. So a permanent magnet will show a strong force reaction over a wider range of the impressed field. No matter how strong an impressed field is, if it is uniform there is no net force only torque. Local force density comes from the product of the magnetization vector in the field gradient tensor. The results of the math can be difficult to visualize, but in the case of the parallel magnets, think about the steel or small magnet as aligning their magnetization with the impressed field flux lines, then following them in the direction where they become denser. For example, the flux lines concentrate at the ends of the rod magnets, so that is mostly where something released in the vicinity of a rod magnet will land. Notice that the combined effect of the two parallel magnets is to concentrate the flux a bit in the very center and in regions above and below on the central plane. One can crudely think of this as behaving as if there were virtual magnets above and below. So in this case, a small steel or magnet object constrained to stay near the central axis will move towards one of these regions, above, below, or in the middle depending on where it's released. The one in the middle has the strongest field and is the strongest, most stable axial confinement because of that. 
The anti-parallel case is harder to understand because the field is left-right and the magnetization of the ball is thus also left-right, yet the force is vertical. The force does not follow the field direction, in fact it is perpendicular to it. In this image it is not easy to see the flux density along the axis, but no flux gets to the very center. At the center of an identical but anti-parallel magnet pair, the field must cancel to be zero. The field is also zero far enough away. So there is a maximum field somewhere along the axis on each side of the magnet pair. Where the field is maximum, the energy density is maximum. A general principle of mechanics is that small objects push towards the most accessible region of highest local energy density. But when constrained to the axis, the ball will pull to a spot either above or below the magnet pair. In the anti-parallel case, there is no stable position in the very center. In both cases, the stable position moves away as I move the magnets apart. Let's take a look at one way to make specific predictions about this. I will focus on the parallel magnet case because it is readily generalized. If I orient any number of magnets parallel to each other and create a symmetric polygon with them, then along the central axis the radial field will cancel and there will only be axial fields. The more magnets you use, the more stable the behavior near the axis will be. A ring magnet is the limiting case of this. In the spreadsheet, which you can readily duplicate from the screen captures, I begin by calling the radial distance of each magnet from the axis 1. Whether that is 1 inch, foot, meter, mile, it doesn't matter for the purpose of locating the equilibrium points. I call the distance along the axis y, and the distance to any point y along the axis is called r. Obviously, the magnets I use are not microscopic points, but you can readily look up the formula for the radial and axial field from a point magnetic dipole, so we can make predictions based on that. In this configuration, the radial field cancels everywhere, so that column is just at zero in the spreadsheet. The axial field is proportional to 3 times y squared divided by r to the fifth minus 1 divided by r cubed. The energy density is proportional to the sum of the squares of the field components. Finally, the force density is proportional to the change in energy density at any spot. In all cases, for the purposes of this video, I don't care about the proportionality constants. When I plot the force along the axis, I get all the information I need to find the equilibrium spots. Where the force is not only zero, but pushes back towards the zero force spot from both sides, that is the center of a local axial confinement zone. If you wish to, you can find the full field formula for a dipole. In the same spreadsheet, put in a formula for the radial component and set the horizontal component to zero. That represents the two anti-parallel rod magnet case, and you can see then where the two confinement zones are located. If you put in both components, no cancellation, that represents a single dipole. You will find there are no confinement zones. One needs at least two dipoles to achieve that. The magnets are not microscopic points, so the prediction will not be exact, but it turns out it is close. On the graph, the two zones outside the magnet are about 20% larger than the radius of the magnet from the axis. For the very near configuration in the photograph here, the ball is confined at about the same distance as the magnet is from the axis. So, the prediction based on point dipoles is roughly correct. If you watch the video closely enough, or even better do this yourself, 
you can find that for the second configuration used, that ratio appears to be even closer to the prediction when the distances are larger. That is expected because then the structure is more like the assumptions of the theory used. So this theory lets you understand broadly what is happening and with some modification that also includes why I can hover a small magnet between two bar magnets. Similar to all this, professional scientists and engineers designing or improving magnetic products have a basic understanding of the device operation and can make approximate predictions, but normally require tools like amperes and magneto to make the kind of specific predictions for the value of force, torque, etc. that their work requires. My normal work is to make sure that these products will provide the correct predictions. Since I took apart my cube arrangement of these magnetized spheres, I decided to put them back together again in another interesting configuration, these kinds of rings making up balls like a soccer ball are among my favorite ways to arrange these particular magnets. I have fun doing that, I have fun making this video, I hope that you found it both educational and fun to watch.